You can start, Luis. Okay, thank you. Muito bom dia. Eu sou o Luiz Américo Bonfim, professor adjunto da Universidade Federal de Sergipe, onde atuo como professor do chefe do Departamento de Artes Visuais e Design e professor dos programas de pós-graduação em Ciências da Religião e Cinema, além de ser líder do grupo de pesquisa Observare, estudos empíricos e aplicados em Ciências da Religião. O evento Abralim ao vivo, Linguistics Online, é uma iniciativa da Associação Brasileira de Linguística, em cooperação com várias associações internacionais, entre as quais o Comité Internacional Permanent de Linguistes, a Associação de Linguística e Filologia de América Latina, a Sociedade Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, a Sociedade Espanhola de Linguística, a Linguistic Society of America, Linguistics Association of Great Britain, a Societas Linguística Europeia, a Australian Linguistic Society, a Associação Internacional de Linguística Apliquê e a British Association for Applied Linguistics. Nesta sessão, assistiremos à conferência do professor Tyler Kibbe, que é estudante de pós-graduação e assistente de ensino em linguística da Universidade de Kentucky, nos Estados Unidos. In this session, I will attend Professor Tyler Kibbe's conference. Tyler is a graduate student teaching assistant in linguistics in University of Kentucky. Sua conferência tem como título The Voice and Silent of Divinity, a socio-cognitive linguistic approach to religion's violence. Em nome da Abralin, eu quero agradecer a presença e a participação do professor Tyler Kibbe, a quem dou as boas-vindas e desejo uma excelente apresentação. On behalf of Eberlin, I, I thank the presence and participation of Professor Tyler Kibbe, whom I welcome and wish as, as excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, so my name is Tyler Kibbe. I am currently uh, supposed to be at the University of Humboldt in Berlin. Um, I'm a postgraduate research fellow there. Um, I'm finishing up my graduate studies here at the University of Kentucky, uh, where because of the pandemic, I'm still stuck for the moment. Um, but uh, that makes the time difference a little more bearable. Let me just share my presentation screen. We can get started. Okay. So my presentation today is titled The Voice and Silence of Divinity, a Sociocognitive Linguistic Approach to Religious Violence. And this topic can be somewhat complex. Um, I wanted to sort of find a happy intersection between introductory materials for social science, cognitive science, and linguistic silence, science as it relates to religion. Um, as a starting point, most of my work is based in conceptual metaphor theory. Um, and my first entrance into this topic was about six or seven years ago when I was sitting on, in on a sermon at a local Baptist church for a undergraduate linguistics project. And as I was sitting there, I realized that quite a few of the systems of the conceptual systems within religious rhetoric could be explained by metaphor. However, in trying to apply conceptual metaphor theory to religion. So for instance, to understanding God as a king or as a, um, a friend or as a father, it brought up some and introduced some very troubling uh, semantic and phenomenological issues into the study of religious metaphor. Uh, and this is what that project has sought to uh, amend in some sense. So I want to start off with uh, it's a, either a bad joke or a bad anecdote or both. Uh, but three years ago at the 2017 Linguistics Institute at the University of Kentucky, uh, I took the day off to go to a hookah lounge by myself. Um, and 
I was raised a Baptist and I happened to strike up a conversation with a Muslim man who was getting his PhD in engineering. So we walked into a hookah lounge and we struck up a conversation about God, which is usually what happens when a Baptist and a Muslim who walk into a hookah lounge end up talking about. And he asked me, what is God to a zebra, but all the stripes in the world? In this moment, talking about God and talking about our understanding about God, he created this, at once it was an analogy, but also this very complex metaphor for if zebras had a God, how would they understand God? How would they conceptualize God? For him, it was something um, inherently experiential, something um, embodied, something close to what a zebra is, in this case, um, their appearance. As we got carried on a little more, we started to think about, well, then what is God to a man? If for a zebra, for in his example, if a zebra's God is all the stripes in the world, then how can we account for the variation that we see in uh, humanity's religious systems? And more so for me than from him, thinking about this in terms of conceptual metaphor theory, how could we apply conceptual metaphor theory and cognitive linguistic science to an understanding of religious rhetoric. And this introduces quite a few problems. Uh, I wanna introduce Rene Girard's work here. He was a um, influential scholar, French scholar on the violence of religion in the 20th century. And his approach, really his critique of modern approaches to religion was that it treated religion as if it was something that was illogical that was unreasonable and that could simply be explained away or solved by uh, humanistic ideals. And he said, and I really enjoy this quote because I believe it sums up this sentiment pretty accurately. He said that by denying religion any basis in reality, by viewing it as a sort of bedtime story for children, we collaborate with violence in its game of deception. And now we can often think, and many people often approach religion as, something that's nonsensical. So the instance or the insistence that God is some sort of folk belief or the superstition of the uneducated. Um, but we actually see that God um, or some divinity or some religious object, whether or not you want to affirm or deny its existence, the concept itself, the social object, the religious object, does have an influence on the world. And we often see that most provocatively in forms of violence. Kierkegaard also noticed this, especially in the way that we talked about religion in his uh, work, Fear and Trembling, in his analysis of um, Abraham and Isaac and the ethical dilemmas posed therein, he discusses the distinction between whether Abraham was going to murder Isaac or whether or not he was gonna sacrifice Isaac. And that distinction between the two, the significance of that distinction, especially if you approach it from either an atheistic or a theistic um, position, uh, really bothered him. And is also an early example of sort of, he wasn't a linguist, but the sort of philosophy of language um, and linguistic approaches to this topic, which as you'll see in the discussion of some of the appropriate literature can be kind of messy. So talking about religious violence and the way that we see the religious object enacted in language, one famous example is from the Albigensian Crusade in Southern France, where the Catholics waged war, a holy war against the Cathars. During the siege of one city, um, Béziers, the papal legate allegedly said, kill them all, let God sort them out. For him, uh, historically, this may or may not have happened, but for him, the sentiment was kill everyone so that we get all the Cathars and all the Catholics will go to heaven so God can sort them out. As this uh, very, a very shorthand rationalization for uh, mass murder. Skipping forward to the 20th century, for especially of significance to the LGBTQ community, we see that um, religious metaphor and especially the way that we conceptualize religious objects is influential in a lot of um, our major events, especially it concerns um, public society and public health. 
In this case, um, just one example of many of a Southern Baptist preacher saying that age was the wrath of God and it was the punishment of a just God. And so that as a way of rationalizing why this horrible thing was happening and also why for him, his congregation, why they shouldn't help people that uh, were suffering from AIDS during the epidemic. In ISIS, we see these complex uh, metaphors being carried over into theopolitical ideologies and ISIS propaganda. So we have actually sort of a cross-cultural example of the war is crusade metaphor. So in 2001, after 9-11, Bush uh, was addressing the American people and he said that his crusade, this war on terrorism was going to take a while. He immediately backtracked and said he was being metaphorical, it wasn't literal. But for ISIS, they really built from this metaphor and they took it as a literal statement about a religious war between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And you see that carried through their, um, the entirety of their propaganda where they often describe um, people such as Barack Obama, um, Jewish people, uh, Muslims that don't support them. They were often described these as crusaders, even though historically and in a literal sense, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't quite make sense in a metaphorical sense either because they're engaging with it in a very real way as if this metaphor used for religion, stemming from religion, contributes in either patently literal or patently metaphorical. We also see this in acts of mass gun violence. So in 2008, there was a shooting at a Knoxville um, Christian church, a progressive church that was publicly accepting of LGBTQ congregation members. In the note that he left for the police to find um, after the shooting, he was ranting about uh, the church members worshiping the God of sec secularism, that they are ultra liberals, a collection of sick, weird and homosexual people and that he wanted to kill Democrats until the cops kill me. And so we see this evolving into, when we're asking questions of religious violence, they're hardly ever in isolation. We're also considering how this connects to other ideologies, how it affects other systems and other social politics. Um, so in the, in the example of the Nashville statement, which was a very prominent um, conservative statement in 2017 in the United States, we see this being formalized as a statement of God created the universe in this way, X, Y, and Z, and it gives us permission to do X, Y, and Z things to other people in order to keep that the way that God wanted it to be. And it's not something that's reserved and for what's important for a metaphorical approach is it's not something isolated. It's not idiosyncratic. So this was easily transported to um, the Netherlands. Uh, Dutch in 2019. So we also see this, maybe not so clearly violence, but also these underlying systems, these way about rationalizing and reasoning within the world, we see these affecting wider issues and coming up, coming up and arising in very minute ways that we sometimes have to pick apart or follow breadcrumbs to arrive at an adequate conceptual metaphor theoretic approach to that topic. In this case, uh, the Kavanaugh Senate confirmation hearing, where God didn't come up quite often, but a belief in God, the underlying assumptions about one's ideology, one's conceptualization of the world in which one resides, and what that means about a person's ethics, was brought up occasionally to confirm uh, Brett Kavanaugh, who was, um, the, uh, who was accused of um, rape. And it was used to, for many of the conservative politicians, to affirm his moral virtue. At the end of the day, for them, within that ideological system, it didn't matter the truth of the accusation, whether it was more important whether or not Brett Kavanaugh believed that he was forgiven for his sins in this case. Now, here's where it gets messy. And so we have the big cognitive science of religion question, which is really just the big science of religion question. 
simply how can we study religion and religious belief in any scientifically meaningful way? This has been one of the longstanding issues that has divided theology from science, um, the empirical from the religious. If you can't prove it exists and you can't prove it doesn't exist, can you say anything meaningful, anything empirical about it? For us, we wanna ask what can a science of language tell us about religion and how can we ensure that it is empirical when we approach it from linguistic science? So I don't wanna to spend too much time on conceptual metaphor theory because my work does deviate quite significantly from it. But for those who aren't familiar with conceptual metaphor theory, essentially it takes the stance that metaphor is a cognitive process of conceptualizing generally more abstract concepts in terms of more concrete concepts. And of course, there is a wide range of um, theoretical arguments discussing every minute detail of conceptual met metaphor theory. Um, uh, Turner earlier in this series uh, gave a presentation um, talking about uh, conceptual blending. So that's another example um, of part of this body of literature. Um, when we're talking about cognitive linguistics, especially as it relates to metaphors and conceptualization. But for our purposes here, we just, we can only, um, or we only need to know that conceptual metaphor theory makes the argument that metaphor is a cognitive process and not simply ornamentation. And this notation uses the form X is Y. So uh, time is money, life is a journey, um, up is good, and so on and so on. Now, what's important for us here is that Lake Off and Johnson and the body of work that they build between 1980 and the publication of Metaphors We Live By um, and the 20 or 30 so years afterwards is this classical contemporary dichotomy. Specifically, they set up a dichotomy between classical rhetoric and contemporary philosophy. They assume that the classical world's approach to metaphor was restricted to rhetoric. So in the works um, stemming from the works of Aristotle, poetics and rhetoric. The idea that metaphor was simply a sort of a poetic device. It was a means of providing um, uh, imagistic flourish to speeches or to just in general, just the way we communicate about the world. They, they formulated a contemporary opposition to it, saying that instead metaphor was again, a cognitive process and not simply about making language look pretty. Now, in the application of that to religious language and to religious metaphor, there hasn't really been any consensus, let alone a concrete or cohesive body of work that has sought to address the issue of religious metaphor. Some early theology about how metaphorical truth as devised by Lakoff and Johnson um, was similar to and could be informative to a concept of religious truth. So, so, so Skiche 1985 is probably the best example of this. Certainly theologians have taken up conceptual metaphor theory to talk about its implications for theology. Um, but all non-theological applications of conceptual metaphor theory as I'll show briefly here in a second, they've either dismissed the religious validity of the experiencer, so of the faithful, um, so dismiss the experience of God for the Christian um, or um, Allah for the Muslim. Um, they treat the religious object as something that the experience of which is ultimately inconsequential to the study of metaphor, which, causes a very stark divide between approaches that's not explicitly formulated as such. In some approaches, we see positive a priori assumptions being made about the religious object. So in the case of um, discussing Christian metaphor, you often see scientists raised within a predominantly Christian society giving more credence to Christian experience or Christian understandings of the ineffable of the religious object than when they're analyzing uh, the religious objects and the metaphors for those objects in other religions. On the other hand, we often see 
linguists um, and language scientists taking a very hard empirical approach and trying to be as empirical as possible with conceptual metaphor theory, they take a negative, a hard negative a priori assumption or a priori stance about the religious object, saying that the religious object is either has predefined cultural properties, is largely inconsequential to the discussion of metaphor, um, or that the experience of that religious object is a based on a misunderstanding of the experiencer. John Wisdom in 1944 gives a good um, example or a sort of a thought experiment and how people approach the issue of religious experience. So in his example, he says that uh, when two people come to a garden after being away for 10, 20 years, they see that um, even though there are weeds in the garden, some of the flowers have been growing quite well um, and even flourishing. And he says that um, in his thought experiment, one of the uh, one of the travelers says um, one of the travelers says, "Well, with those flowers flourishing, there must be a gardener." The other one says, "No, it's just nature. There is no gardener." And then they spend the next 20 pages trying to decide whether or not it's an invisible gardener, whether or not the gardener comes in secret, um, laying out traps and trying to devise situations where they can figure out um, where's this gardener coming from. And ultimately they can't agree to disagree or come to any sort of uh, conclusion on any point whatsoever. And so we see this just playing out again and again and again in the literature um, because we have these implicit assumptions that in conceptual metaphor theory, we don't necessarily need to uh, amend or contend with. What's interesting about conceptual metaphor theory, especially this contemporary and classical divide that Lake Goff and Johnson um, develop, is that it actually stands in stark contrast to much of the history of linguistics, especially in the Western world, where linguistics predominantly comes out of a theological tradition of um, discussing uh, for much of uh, early pre-modern uh, language science discussing uh, the origins of language in terms of biblical text. But setting that aside for a moment, if we think about finding a body of literature for religious metaphor, there's really no one better to turn to than the theologians themselves who have to work with this day in and day out. How do we talk about God? How do we convince other people about our beliefs. And we see this just played out over and over and over again and again throughout religious history. And we actually see in these attempts that have been excluded from the tradition, we see formulations of metaphor theory that are surprisingly contemporary. Although they wouldn't use the words cognitive, um, uh, just simply because it's anachronistic, um, these definitely have a uh, anachronist or a uh, cognitive sense to them. So Philo of Alexandria um, in, at the uh, turn of the millennium, the first millennium, um, when he's talking about, he's a Hellenic Jewish scholar um, working in Alexandria. He talks about the comprehensibility of God, that um, God is beyond understanding except for the fact that he exists. Um, and he, his body of work simply on this one topic um, can easily fill hundreds and hundreds of pages of um, numerous volumes. St. Augustine of Hippo um, was notoriously problematic for constantly going back throughout his life, trying to figure out whether or not he could have a literal belief in scripture. And ultimately he comes to the conclusion that Christians um, will not have the nerve, or oh, what is this? Sorry. Um, he says, no Christian, I mean, will have the nerve to say that they should not be taken in a figurative sense. Um, he's and specifically talking about Genesis. He says that taking them in a literal sense um, borders on the absurd um, and that it's unconvincing in a, for him in a rational sense. And so he tries to uh, reconcile that with an idea of figurative truth, a figurative divine truth. Pseudodionysius the Aeropagite takes a much more radical approach in just saying, we can't say anything about the divine object. He says that the divine object must be approached through a darkness of unknowing. For him, you could only say things in the negative. You can only say what God is not, but you can't predicate anything about him. Ibn Tufal, who was a um, golden age Muslim scholar, 
um, in the tradition of Ibn Sina, talks about God um, transcending and being totally free of the objects that are used to understand him. He wonders why at length in his book, um, The Life of Hai Ibn Yaksan, uh, why God doesn't just reveal himself to humans. Um, and he tries to rationalize this as uh, a way, as he understands it, of God allowing humans to conceptualize God and come to an understanding of God through the world that he has created for them. Thomas Aquinas takes the probably the most uh, interesting approach by simply saying that metaphors for God, being that God can only be spoken of metaphorically, are literal, since those metaphors are, in a sense, the only thing that can be said of God. And so if they are true in some sense, then they must be literal in that sense only. Uh, for him, this is a very complex theology, and we can we don't have to deal with it too much here. Now, Benjamin Keach, he was a practical Baptist who actually developed this compendium, this practical reference of biblical metaphors for preachers. And while he was working from the tradition of rhetoric, he approached metaphor, especially in sermons, as a way of um, making abstract concepts comprehensible. It wasn't simply about, as uh, Lakoff and Johnson would have us believe, um, the rhetorical notion of um, rhetorical flourish or making language beautiful. For him, it was a practical tool. It was a matter of borrowing from the visible world to make and illustrate the concepts of the invisible world. So for taking from the natural world to ascribe certain qualities to the supernatural world. We also see plenty of precursors for this in um, philosophy, the philosophy of religion, um, meteor meteorology. Uh, we see this in logic. Um, and a few examples would just be uh, Menong's jungle, um, which is, can we say true, true or false things about um, imaginary objects? Uh, Grand Priest Dialetheist logic, so the idea of true contradictions, so like Schrodinger's cat, um, Immanuel Kant's pure reason, William James Prima Materia, Paul Tillich's ultimate concern, Heidegger's being itself. Um, we see this sort of, the same conclusion arrived at by numerous scholars throughout history in different fields trying to attempt different questions who all essentially come to the conclusion that, well, there's something ineffable, there's something there. We can talk about it, but we're not sure how we're going to talk about it. And so for us here, we want to talk about it. And so when we're talking about it in terms of metaphor, we can make a differentiation between three types of religious metaphors. Metaphors from religion. So metaphors that take a religious domain as its source domain. Um, and this, so for example, beauty is divinity. So um, he looks like a god, uh, he's an Adonis, um, she's an Aphrodite, right? So making these sort of comparisons between, um, so the source domain of divinity um, and attributing it to a certain quality. We have metaphors for religion. So metaphors that are not about a religious object or about a divine entity, but are instead about um, some aspect of religious life. The metaphor, um, a life is a journey, and Christianity is often augmented to be a Christian life is a good journey. Now, what we want to focus on is metaphors of religion. So talking about the King of Kings, the Prince of Peace, um, uh, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Ghost, how these objects are conceptualized and how we make use of um, our cognitive linguistic resources to make these objects comprehensible. So here's the big, the first big science of religious language question, which is how can we study how people talk about the religious object, whether it's literal or metaphorical, um, if we can't make any empirical claims about that religious object. Like many of the philosophers before, we simply have to develop an analytic concept. Um, so in this case, we have to figure out what we wanna say the target domain is. Uh, for my work, uh, this takes the somewhat appropriately named um, title, the leap of faith argument, which is simply four propositions that allow us a starting point for discussing the ineffable. So the first, um, move that over there. Uh, 
The first is simply that the ineffable concept omega exists as a disembodied concept, that it is something separate and removed from our embodied experience, from our world as a real world reference, um, and that we can talk about it. Simply uh, in Heidegger's sense, there is something that is, isness itself. The second uh, step we need to take is to just affirm that source domains cannot map onto this concept. And this is important because in conceptual metaphor theory, we it's a, there's a very strong notion of the source domain mapping onto properties of the target domain. For our purposes here, we can't ascribe any to the target domain. So instead of mapping, we want to say that uh, the target domain omega, this ineffable religious object, possesses no coherent or stable ontology in and of itself. So we can't say anything about it really. The third move we wanna make, and I'm having to keep on moving this down. The third move we wanna make is to say that as such, uh, this domain necessitates an ontological shift that because we can't map properties from the source domain onto the target domain, that instead what we see is the target or the source domain is shifted in its entirety into the target domain. So say something about it, or we can't say anything about it, but we can talk about it. Uh, one example that might make this a little easier to understand is uh, actually in mathematics, it's Cantorian set theory, where we have to reconcile our understanding of the natural numbers, which are an infinite set. So which are truly infinite, They're, it's a true infinity. Um, you can't name the last number in the set of the natural numbers, but through some theoretical math that we don't have to talk about, um, we can describe the numerality um, or in a sense, the cardinality of the set of the natural numbers. And so in Cantorian set theory, that is Alice null. Um, for our purposes here, we can talk about that in terms of the ineffable object omega so omega, gamma. And four, uh, similar, I guess this could be restated as simply a recursive principle, is that you can put together many of these metaphors to form systematic holes that have systematic and complex structures that we can either notate as omega yn and yn plus one or omega delta. So in the omega delta in this sense would be the theonym or the name for God. Now, the second big question, and I'm just moving this around everywhere. So we have a notational system. We've just, as an analytic concept, we've proposed this thing that we can talk about and we've ascribed certain properties to it. Okay, so now how do we talk about it? What types of metaphors are actually occurring when we're ascribing certain source domains to the target domain? And this is where we wanna make a distinction between two types of concepts. One being the simple um, individual endpoint concepts. So omega gamma, this is a full omega is y, one single line um, equation, essentially one line of notation. We can think of this as if we're thinking of the world as a series of boxes, we exist within a world that can only see the boundaries of the world. We can see the boundaries or the limits of our ability to comprehend and understand certain things. But because we're reasoning creatures, we can also reason beyond our limits. We can say that there is something like what we understand beyond the limits of our understanding. And we ascribe to it certain qualities that are based in our embo embodied reality. So if we think about the world as a box, we can't see beyond the box, but we can maybe reasonably understand what's beyond it as a bigger box and then another bigger box after that and a bigger and bigger box on and on and on until you get to a concept that is so incomprehensibly incomprehensible that you can say things about it but it makes no intelligible sense whatsoever those concepts we're not going to talk about but the more complex um, concepts that maybe have four or five six substructures um, or combinations of endpoint concepts, we can talk about as illithiate concepts, which are the complex religious objects um, of our embodied and, in a sense, disembodied worlds. Endpoint concepts 
probably what most people are familiar with in this sense. Um, so they have four subtypes, uh, spatial endpoints such as infinity, temporal endpoints, um, eternity, various property endpoints. So in Christianity, this is often represented as omni traits. So omnipresent, omnipotent, omnibenevolent. Um, and we also see object endpoints, which are taking certain objects and certain image schemas essentially to their illogical extremes. For spatial endpoints, um, we can make many different distinctions between these spatial source domains. And so with endpoints, it's difficult to ascertain any sort of uh, fundamental source domain. It's, it's hard to tell whether or not the, the base notation for infinity in this sense is, is it omega is space or is it omega is three dimensionality? Is it a matter of number and sequence or is it a matter of spatial relations? So in this case, we could um, break it down into different dimensions. Uh, three-dimensionality, two-dimensionality, one-dimensionality, and zero-dimensionality. Um, and we can predict that we would find different uh, conceptual realizations that still follow certain properties that are infinite. We actually don't have to go too far. Well, too far, it's about 120 years, 140 years ago. Um, but we can actually see an example of um, the zero-dimensionality, so the infinite abyss, um, in Abbott's land, a romance of many dimensions, um, wherein this two-dimensional self journeys to a one-dimensional world and tries to tell the beings in that world what two dimensions is like or what three dimensions is like. Um, for the singularity that he eventually arrives at, he says, behold that miserable creature, that point is a being like ourselves, but confined to the non-dimensional gulf. Um, he has not a thought of plurality for he is himself his one and all being really nothing. And so we see these predictable elements that we can, uh, that we can notate as a, uh, as an endpoint concept, a spatial endpoint concept. In this case, um, omega is zero dimensionality. Uh, the non-dimensional gulf is what Abbott calls it. Time's a little more simple. Uh, our understanding, our experiential understanding of time is much more limited. Usually we understand time in terms of space. But if we want to take a concept of time and um, ontologically shift it into omega, we get the fairly universal concept eternity, which is just all time. Um, the other, sometimes you see examples of this nevernity, um, sometimes, most of the times in fiction. So, um, you know, you freeze time and it lasts forever. Time gets stuck. It's just time not happening forever, which becomes a point of true contradiction. And we don't really want to talk about that because it, it turns um, classical logic on its head and it gets us into a lot of problems that we otherwise wouldn't want to deal with. Property endpoints, like I said, are sort of the Christian equivalents of, um, or the equivalents of the Christian omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. It takes a quality and expands it to its illogical extreme. It's not hyperbole. It's not an exaggeration. It's, it's making, it's ascribing a certain infinite quality to that property. So for instance, omega is presence, omnipresence. If you're here and you're, if, if you're infinitely here, then you're everywhere, but you're also, more than everywhere. We see this also sometimes described object endpoints, like in uh, Borges' uh, the library. So Borges was a um, as Argentinian essayist in the last century. Um, in his story, the library, he has a library that goes on and on forever. And this infinite library, Omega is a library. We see certain predictable entailments from this metaphor. Um, for him, an infinite library has infinite books. And so that's all the, so for him, the commentaries on the gospel, the commentaries on the commentaries on the gospel, uh, the true story of your death, the translation of every book in all languages, um, an infinite number of languages to translate an infinite number of books into, and so on and so on. And he goes on for many pages, uh, sort of extrapolating the entailments of this metaphor. Illithiate concepts are what we want to focus on when we're talking about religious violence, however. 
So these complex concepts, because they, because they require an ontological stability, um, they have to maintain a strict internal logic. So in this example, we have an illithiac concept for the supreme evil entity. In Christianity, it's Satan. It could be, you know, the devil. Um, it's an description of first causality, then agency, then evil to an ineffable concept um, in that strict order so that causality is more primary than agency and agency is more primary than its evil nature. If we return to the example from the beginning of the presentation, uh, what has gotten to a zebra, um, we can see that first we have a property endpoint. Omega is a cause, so causality. Then we have another property endpoint. Omega is agency. Then we have another property endpoint. It's morality. So we want to make this an omnibenevolent zebra god in this example. And then finally, we have an object endpoint, which gives us the image schematic material for the religious object. So Omega is a zebra. In this case, we get the zebra god, all the stripes in the world. We can also see um, some very interesting structures appear out of this notational framework. Uh, so for instance, in this sermon from a Central Baptist Church in Kentucky, um, we have God, instead of simply being understood as God the Father, we see God taking on different genders depending on the roles that he, um, that God, and not he, just in this case, it's just God, um, is playing within the, uh, the narrative of the sermon. So. He is uh, like a mother's tender love, like a father's supportive love, like a parent's best ever love. And so for this conception of God, instead of gender, in this case, uh, masculinity being inherent to the internal structure of a God the father, um, we see a base structure for God that has been extrapolated into diverging metaphors that are not internally contradictory. So in this sense, this religious object, Omega God, um, following this construction can be understood as a mother, a father, um, and a gender neutral parent, um, depending on the situation. And that doesn't present any sort of internal contradiction um, that would necessitate any sort of complex theological moves to remedy. Another example of this um, from a conservative uh, Baptist church in Tennessee, um, we see the traditional masculine Satan being extrapolated into three different genders within an internal structure. So we end up with three distinct religious objects. Um, so the masculine evil entity is becomes Satan. The evil feminine entity becomes Sophia, the queen of heaven. Um, and then there's an evil um, feminine and masculine entity called the universal life spirit. Um, and we can extrapolate these religious objects from the way in which uh, the, their conceptualization is rationalized and negotiated throughout the sermon. Um, so in this last portion, the spirit of Satan, of Lucifer, the one who came forth from the emanation, but also Sophia, you remember. You've got Sophia on one hand, feminine, Lucifer on the other, masculine. Uh, now the queen of heaven is feminine, Lucifer is masculine, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, this sermon, although it doesn't concern us here, um, negotiates these concepts um, and these complex sort of gendering, internal gendering of these concepts um, as a way of uh, creating a transphobic theology, essentially. So that brings us into the social question of religious language and how it relates to, you know, a science of religion and a science of religious language. Um, so how do people use it to actually understand the world? Or what do you do when your good God does a bad thing? What happens when there's a contradiction or some sort of violation of that internal logic? What happens and how do you react? Uh, Pliny the Younger describing how people reacted to the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the second century AD um, in writing to the historian Herodotus says, a few in their fear of death were praying for death. Many were raising their hands to implore the gods, but more took the view that no gods now existed anywhere and that this was an eternal and final darkness hanging over the world. So he describes three different ways in which a religious object, in this sense, some divinity is broken down. Either it's strongly affirmed, strongly denied, or uh, 
a mixture of the two where it's just simply uh, altered in some way. And here's where we get the sociocognitive linguistic approach that we've all been building up to, the voice and silence of God, where we have a non Caesarian sign where the reference is the ineffable and the, uh, uh, the way in which we conceptualize God, word wouldn't be quite accurate, um, is itself a formulation of the religious object as a religious object. Neither one can be uh, coexistent with the other, um, and it's constantly being deconstructed and reconstructed in this system where, wherein it encounters certain violations to a inherently contradictory internal logic, and then it seeks to reconcile them. This is helpful for approaching uh, the language of religious violence and how language structures religious violence because it allows us to abstract the moral aspects of violence onto conceptual structures. So in the case of violent actions, we can talk about conceptual maladaptations. In the case of positive actions or actions that don't exact any specific influence, negative influence on the world, we can talk about conceptual equilibrium or conceptual maintenance. In cases where we see socially beneficial outcomes, uh, we can talk about this in terms of conceptual adaptation. So as a non Caesarian sign, we can talk about the way, and this allows us to talk about the way that religious objects, as they are linguistically realized, are rooted in the world. And so we see this in Pliny's description of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, um, we see this in the uh, cult of the snake god Glycon in Greece, which was a con man using a snake puppet to fool people into thinking that there was a talking snake god. Um, and then after he died and after he'd made all this money, people still kept believing in this snake god um, for centuries afterwards. Um, during, um, the, during the rule of Pope Stephanus VI, uh, we see him exhume his predecessor, Pope Formosus, um, and hold the cadaver synod, whereby Pope Formosus as being the physical embodiment of Christ on earth, Christ vicar on earth, um, is put on trial for corruption, essentially, uh, because within that understanding, because Christ is undying and because the Pope is then some, a representation of Christ on earth, um, not a literal transubstantiation, but a representative of Christ on earth. Um, the logic for that cadaver synod for putting a corpse on trial um, is not internally contradictory and has a very strict and robust logic to it. So rather than simply, again, dismissing this as just superstition or um, you know figurative nonsense, we can actually ascribe certain very real social and cognitive um, realities to these concepts. When we're approaching the analysis of religious language and religious objects as they're realized linguistically, we need to take, because it's a non Caesarian sign and we wanna do in this instance, synchronic analysis, we need to start with an analytic concept that can serve as a starting point. So in this instance, um, much in the intuitivist tradition of Lakoff and Johnson, um, we might wanna intuitively ascribe a certain proto-construction um, that we can then work from throughout a given text. So in this case, the evil entity, the Satan figure, um, at a minimum, the basis for a religious object like that. So in this sense, causality, agency, and evilness. And then as a notational framework, we can then talk about how that internal logic is negotiated. Here, lots of notation, lots of arrows, lots of brackets. Um, we'll walk through it together. Um, we see what might happen when an all sovereign God exists in a certain person's um, conceptual embodied world, but then something horrible happens. Say someone believes very strongly in God, but then a close loved one passes away. Um, and then this challenges their understanding of God. This challenges their understanding of the world. If God is all good, why would he let this bad thing happen, right? Why did my good God do a bad thing? 
one way is to simply, one way to resolve the violation of a good God doing a bad thing is to simply negate everything except the basic subcomponents of the religious object. In this case, the religious object, the ineffable, is not some all sovereign, all omnibenevolent God, but is instead just this nothing causality, this infinite and eternal initial cause. Um, so uh, in this sense, we get omega is cause, omega is nothing, um, the great nothingness. And we might ascribe this to certain atheistic beliefs if we want to approach it through uh, this framework. Now, here at the very end, I want to touch on a practical case study that's um, particularly of significance to our own linguistic traditions, and that being um, the Journal of John Allen Chow and how we can use this to understand the ideology behind Christian imperialism, um, but also um, Christian linguistics in many senses. So John Chow, for those of you who don't know, was an American missionary who journeyed to North Sentinel Island um, in the Bay of Bengal in 2018 to contact a quote unquote uncontacted uh, people living on the island um, in relative isolation um, in order to convert them to Christianity and to spread the word of God. Um, he kept a journal throughout this in which he details his interactions um, with the Sentinelese as well as his internal rationalizations of the danger he's putting himself into for God's mission and God's work on the island and his understanding of the situation. And through that journal, we can glean certain instances or certain examples of the way in which those religious objects are linguistically realized. And we can notate them in such a way that we can work through Chow's logic, how he linguistically and you know, sociocognitively negotiates uh, the religious object and its representation linguistically and ideologically. So for John Allen Chow, the central metaphor, the central religious object was God as king, so as a sovereign entity. Now, in a unamended um, sort of uh, regular conceptual metaphor theoretic approach, going throughout this text, we would ascribe four different metaphors for God, whatever we want to say that that concept is. God is sovereign, God is a potter, God is a father, and God is a guardian. Within this approach, we can actually subsume most of those under one central illithiate concept. So the linguistic realization um, and the internal logic of a the religious object for child, that being the moral all sovereign, the omnibenevolent uh, king of kings. Uh, so we get instances of your child being uh, God's ambassador to the Andamanese, um, talking about God's kingdom, his rule and reign, the throne of God. Uh, how God is a father to his people, how God protects him and guides him, um, much like an omnibenevolent king would. And then we can see an example of an outlying metaphor that's not part of the internal structure of the religious object. In this case, uh, the moral all-sovereign Chow's God is a potter. So understanding this cohesive structure in terms of a subsidiary metaphor. And so here notated at the bottom is that conceptual framework. Now, throughout this, throughout his journal, he's detailing his negotiations with his own mortality. So essentially his all loving God, his all good God and his mind would only want the best for him. So why is he wanting him to be put in constant danger? So Chow's thinking, trying to think through, well, maybe I should go home, maybe I should give up. Um, he says, if you want me to get actually shot or even killed with an arrow, then so be it. He's saying, He's continually coming back to this, this you know, notion of very natural notion. I don't want to die. Um, so why does my God want to put me in this danger? For him, his solution is to simply say that, okay, maybe my God isn't all good, but because he's all powerful, I still have to do it, right? So in this sense, we see that the violation is child's mortality. Um, and he amends this violation by simply negating the substructure that denotes God's uh, inherent morality, so his omnibenevolence. So what's the point? You know, what's the point of all this? Uh, what's the point of developing this very practical system, this very 
Um, and it's notational framework, this very unsightly system for denoting religious objects and talking about religious violence. Um, well, it's simply a matter of the fact that religious violence is unsightly and impractical. It's something that is pervasive throughout our society and there's no simple reduction um, of the way that these religious logics, these internal logics for religious objects operate. So for Chow, there was no contradiction in him serving God's mission that he knew would ultimately lead to his death. There's no contradiction in um, the danger that he knowingly exposed the Sentinelese people to um, in terms of uh, viruses and disease that they had, wouldn't have had um, um, any immune, immunity to. Um, and he says there at the end of his journal that he, when he's watching the sunset, that he wonders if it'll be the last sunset he ever sees before being in the place where the sun never sets. But, before being in a place of eternal, you know, daytime, right? Eternal sunlight. You know, he starts, he cries. He has a very emotional response to it. But within this very impractical notational system, we can see that there is to his actions and that he's not simply acting irrationally. He's acting very logically, simply within a very school system. And again, with Rene Girard, we want to say, even if we don't necessarily believe in religion. So for me, I'm not necessarily um, strongly theistic, but we do want to ascribe a certain reality to these theistic worlds because, and these theistic ideologies and realities because they affect us very strongly. They have very immediate effects on us, um, especially in acts of uh, violence, whether it's individual or state-sponsored. So what are some general implications about the voice and silence of God? Well, in the first part, we see that at the very least, we need a theoretical amendment to conceptual metaphor theory. That we definitely need, if metaphor is primarily experientially based, we definitely want to validate religious experience when we're talking about metaphor. Otherwise, when we're talking about religious metaphor. Otherwise, talking about religious metaphor in terms of conceptual metaphor theory, doesn't make sense theoretically if we're invalidating the experience that is supposedly underlying the metaphors themselves. At the same time, we wanna provide this social diachronic context in which we can talk about these newly amended um, metaphorical concepts. So endpoint concepts and illithiac concepts because they can only exist diachronically. We wanna to have to set up a certain system that we can use analytically to discuss them and to discuss their variation and the way in which they're realized linguistically. In this case, we can talk about it in terms of the Vox et Silentium Dei or the voice and silence of God, which we see recurring thematically throughout discussions of um, theological discussions of religious metaphor in numerous religious traditions. And finally, again, while this theory and while this approach is bulky and impractical and maybe a bit hard to approach for the novice, is at once seamless and unified in its approach to religious language, um, especially the religious language uh, that underlies ideologies of religious violence. And I think that despite its impracticality, uh, that benefit in and of itself uh, justifies the pursuit of, at the very least, certain amendments to conceptual metaphor theory that can better allow us to approach these topics. Uh, I would like to briefly acknowledge um, the University of Kentucky Center for Equality and Social Justice for funding much of my research over the last two years, um, as well as for the, uh, the Center for Graduate and Professional Diversity Initiatives at the University of Kentucky and the University of Kentucky's Graduate Student Congress for funding many of my uh, travels to various conferences and institutes uh, during the previous two years. Thank you. Ok, mais uma vez obrigado ao professor Tyler Kibbe. Once again, thank you very much, professor Tyler Kibbe. Eu agradeço também a audiência e a participação do público e dos intérpretes. Gostaria de renovar, nesse momento, a importância na Associação Abralim, 
para o fortalecimento da área dos estudos de linguística no Brasil e engajamento da comunidade neste e em outros projetos. Né? Então, continue assistindo aí as próximas apresentações. E, nesse momento, eu queria conduzir algumas questões ao professor Tyler. Eu vou iniciar com uma questão que eu vou passar diretamente para ele. É, in Latin America popular Catholicism, there is a very common read that of the so-called popular canonizations. Uh, in a considerable part of the cases, the greatest motivation for identifying the new sancti, sanctity is the martyrdom uh, witnessed by a violent death, whether accidental or purposeful, especially violence against children and women. Ethnographic studies highlight the internal logic structure of the mythical narratives described in the tragic life stories. Can this process of memory production be understood within the conceptual metaphor theory? Uh, yes. Uh very easily so so uh, i mean the social the social uh impetus for understanding that form of violence um in terms of sanctity um is immediately present because we want to rationalize certain violent deaths and also um make sense of why something so horrible is happening within the real world and so martyrdom is a very immediate um rationalization for that uh And so in a sense, it's a way, um, like we saw with Chow, he's trying to rationalize his understanding of God and his own experience of violence by saying that maybe God isn't good. But when, what we see in martyrdom is instead we want the process that happens is there's an underlying structure that says that God is good. Well, then why did something bad happen? Um, and then the reaction to that is to say, well, God is good. And we are affirming that God is good within that internal metaphorical structure. So the death in some way must be good. And so this is, that would be a very immediate explanation for um, why violence in that, in those cases would be understood in terms of uh, sanctity or martyrdom. Thank you, professor. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, young people linked to insurgent movements, especially in some belligerent Middle Eastern countries, are martyred before their communities when they die in defense of the faith. Can it be said that there is also an ineffable concept that motivates this rites of passage? So, I would say that um, in terms of that, in terms of that specific example, um, we see analogical examples throughout the world in cases of not simply um, a rite of passage, but this martyrdom in defense of the faith as a, a social pressure from collective religious experience. Um, so much in the same way that an individual might understand a certain death as martyrdom, the collective social, cognitive, and linguistic um, experience of religion uh, dictates certain sort of uh, concrete cultural traditions, or in this case, um, a rite of passage. Uh, and the same could be uh, said about much of um, American uh, military life. So. In the predominantly uh, Christian cultural context of America, um, soldiers who die in the Middle East are often understood as uh, dying in defense of the faith as well. É, Ana Beatriz Carvalho says, Great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bom, eu não tenho outras questões aqui. E gostaria de agradecer a todos os presentes pela participação. Once again, Thank you very much, Professor Tiller Kibe, whom I ask uh, for a final words.
Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thank you for having me. Um, and uh, my work has focused predominantly on religious violence and solving larger issues, um, societal issues, and looking at ways that linguistics can be applied to finding solutions for these larger issues. And in that broader sense, I think this webinar series is a very important moment um, within our discipline, especially in its um, accessibility and its uh, longstanding um, or international collaboration between different groups as a way of bringing together different people in different traditions to look into some of the more interesting linguistic questions, but also into addressing wider issues uh, that affect us collectively as a society. Thank you. Okay. Então, gente, muito obrigado pela presença, pela participação. Nós ficamos por aqui. Até a próxima sessão. Um bom dia.